Hi everyone. I wanted to do a quick video today about the latest book I read. It's called The Parthenon Enigma and it's by Joan Breton Connolly. I read this book electronically as I do almost all of my books. So there is, ooh, I've got a glare today. There is the cover. Hope you can see that through the glare. I'm in a different room than I normally do my my videos. So anyway, the Parthenon Enigma, a new understanding of the West's most iconic building and the people who built it um, by Joan, people who made it by Joan Breton Connolly. So um, why did I choose this book? So, you know, I chose this book because I love ancient history and, um, you know, I thought I, w I traveled to, to Athens. That's why I'm wearing my I got this nifty t-shirt there. Um, I traveled to Athens of um, December before last, so a couple, almost a couple of years ago now, and so I had a chance to actually see the Parthenon and the Acropolis, uh, the other temple on the Acropolis, the Erech Erechtheon. Um, so, and I, as I start this video, I want to make a point that I do not know how to pronounce Greek very well, so. Anybody that watches this video that might know Greek or that might be a Greek scholar, I am making a disclaimer right here that I will probably butcher people's names and place names. <laughs> so anyway, the Parthenon, the Eric Theon, Eric Theon, which is on the Acropolis, the ruins of which are still on the Acropolis um, today. Um, anyway, I had a chance to see those, so I was real curious about this book, and um, this was... This this book, uh, according to the you know what I saw of it and read of it beforehand, um, descriptions and whatnot and reviews, it appeared to you know offer new interpretations and new um, descriptions of the the building, the Parthenon uh, through history, and uh, you know according and then new interpretations based on the latest sort of last minute research. And so this book kind of related to a book I had just read um, just a few books ago called The Great Sea, which was about the peoples of the Mediterranean. So of course the Athenians um, fit into that book and had, a, it, there wasn't any particular part about the Parthenon itself, but the Athenians themselves um, were in the book. So, um, and I, I read another book called 1177, which was about the Bronze Age, which um, there was a Greek Bronze Age civilization um, also that uh, used the Acropolis, which I'll speak to in a moment. So, so what is the um, what is the the book about? The book is essentially about the Parthenon. So the author um, is a scholar, I believe, at NYU, who studies. Um, the Parthenon and um, ancient Athens and so uh, she really in this book she really um, I think successfully makes an attempt to place us in the context place the Parthenon in the context of Athens of the time it was built which was around 447 to 438 BC so it took almost 10 years to build it and I think they were still decorating it even after that so it's been close to 2,500 years now that it was built and there was a Parthenon actually before this one there was another Parthenon uh, there um, that was never quite completed and it got destroyed in 480 BC um, by the Persians and even before that Parthenon this, the Acropolis itself was a sacred space back into the Mycenaean um, Bronze Age era and even before that in the Neolithic era I believe um, so but she actually puts us in the context of the Athens of when the current Parthenon that we know today um, was being built which was around 400 and like I said 400 and um, like 438 I think is when it when it actually opened maybe if you can say the word opened for it so one thing she's her main sort of thesis about this uh, about the Parthenon is an interpretation of the Eastern frieze so you know how the Parthenon has those sculptures and has those relief sculptures as well as other sculptures that we see in museums today and see on the Parthenon itself um, those um, you know I 
I have, like I said, I went to the Acropolis Museum in Athens itself, and I saw a lot of the sculptures that were there, and I've actually been to London before, and I've seen the sculptures that are there uh, that came off of the Parthenon, but I had never really put the whole thing in context before, so this book really did that for me, and I, I really appreciate that. I got a lot of a lot of new information from this book about the, the decoration on the, on the Parthenon, but particularly this eastern frieze, which has this scene that has been interpreted differently throughout time. And um, so this, the author's um, idea of what this represents is the sacrifice of a young girl um, back, it's actually in mythological times, so I, you know, it's unclear to me or maybe unclear to everyone if there was an actual sacrifice or if it's just in mythological time. What happened was, so the story of of Athens itself, um, how it became Athena, you know, the goddess Athena was the patron goddess of, of Athens, and back in mythological time, she and Poseidon had a fight over who was going to get to be the the patron goddess of Athena, of Athens, and um, Athena ended up winning. Well, this battle actually took place, I think, on top of the Acropolis, because I think there's some kind of trident where uh, Poseidon threw a trident and it, you know, it's stuck in the ground there or something and Athena planted an olive tree or something. Anyway, Athena ends up winning that battle, but Poseidon's son later on leads this army of Thracians into, into Athens to, um, you know, take over the city for Poseidon. And, um, so the king at the time, whose name is Eric Theos, goes to the oracle at Delphi and asks her, um, yeah, what's going to happen, you know? And she says, well, unless you sacrifice a young girl, your daughter, um, then, you know, the, you, the city will fall to, to Poseidon's son, whose name is escaping me right now. It's something like Eumola. I'm not even going to try. Anyway, he, um, so King Eric, Eric, Eric Theos, um, you know, breaks the news to his wife, Praxithea, um, what the oracle has said, and, you know, she's all for it, because she, um, she understands that the city, um, you know, that the city needs to be saved, and, um, so she, um, willingly gives up her daughter, you know, I think she says something like, you know, if I had sons, I would send them to fight and die for the city, and I would do the same for my daughters, and so if my daughter has to die, um, then, you know, that's the way it should be for the benefit of the whole city. So her other two daughters, there's three of them, the other two daughters vow if their sister's going to die, then they will also die, and I believe they, um, end up throwing themselves off of the Acropolis or something like that. Well, anyway, so this scene that's on the Acropolis um, depicts this, according to the author, where there's a young girl, I think, and, you know, she's got, um, she's got like her funeral dress, which has a Greek name, and um, her dad, her father's getting ready to, to slay her, and, um, and the rest of the scene plays out, then, um, or the rest of that scene sort of describes this moment in time where the young girl is getting ready to be sacrificed and um, the other two daughters are getting ready to be, um, to die as well. And then um, the um, Poseidon's son will end up getting defeated and Athena will wind up still being the, the goddess for the city. So that's her, sort of her thesis. And, you know, I thought it was real interesting because the way that we know this story is, um, you know, a lot of this ancient information, you know, was lost. Uh, so much has been lost from the ancient world. And, um, but the the speech of Praxithea, the, the wife of Eric Theos, is, was, there was Eur the famous Greek playwright Euripides wrote a play about this whole myth, and it was um, called Eric Theos. And, but it's been lost to history. But um, there was a, a big quote from this play was used in an oration that was given at a trial in ancient times, like in, in the B.C. era. So over 2,000 years ago. And so this this piece of the, the play that was quoted in this oration 
existed and it was all, all that existed from the play and it is Praxithea's speech about how she's willing to give up her daughter for the good of Athens and so that all of Athens can be saved. Well, the really interesting thing though was in 1901, so there was these French, ex these French archaeologists that were going to go to Egypt and excavate a Hellenistic cemetery, Hellenistic cemetery from you know, the uh, over 2,000 years ago. And so this particular cemetery, they didn't use, you know, it's not like Tutankhamen, who, who had the gold sarcophagus, etc. This this cemetery, they used, uh, the mummies had paper mache um, mummy cases. And so this guy took um, a bunch of these back to France, and but they had no way to undo the paper mache But eventually, over time, in like the 1950s and 1960s, the technology became such that they could undo the mummy cases, and they could actually see that the paper that the mummy cases were made out of was old Greek texts. And among those Greek texts were more lines from that play. Um, the Eric Theos play from, by Euripides. So isn't that amazing? I just think that's so amazing that that. And then, and then that was published in France. It took a while. I think it was only published in English, something like the nineties, nineteen nineties. So relatively, you know, recently, um, that this information, um, and more information about this this play came came to to knowledge. You know, came to full knowledge. So I thought that was really cool. Anyway, um, I'm going to run out of time here, so I want to quickly wrap up with what I, you know, what my, my takeaway, my experiences were um, with the with the book. So one thing, it really put me in the place of, of the time and place of ancient Athens and what the Parthenon as a living be building was. I wanted to mention, though, uh, how that became sacred space was uh, the, the the Parthenon and the Eric Theon is in this myth when the daughter is uh, sacrificed and uh, Athena tells the mother Praxithea you know build a temple to the maidens and the Parthenons actually the word Parthenon actually means the maidens and then build another temple called Eric Theon which means you know for her husband and she was the first uh, priestess of both of those you know they were they were both of those sacred spaces had the same sacrificial altar um, and they had a festival um, to this altar in, involving this altar uh, altar that went on for centuries and centuries and finally didn't get stopped until something like you know a couple hundred years into the modern era the Something like 200 and something, I think, A.D. So it went on for several centuries. Anyway, um, it was really interesting, though, to put myself back in, to put myself in the context of the, the Parthenon in its context. And, um, you know, one thing about that, I think, is just the violence. It's such a violent society. Um, you know, animals sacrificed, animals by the hundreds, um, were sacrificed on these altars to these, you know, at these temples. So we have this idea of Greece, Greeks as being this balanced, like, intellectual uh, people, but they were very um, religious and they were very violent, um, not just towards um, other species, but uh, towards each other. Um, they were in almost a constant state of warfare, and the Parthenon was just filled with boot, with uh, helmets and swords and spears that they'd captured from people they'd killed. So they, they was just a really violent, um, really violent society. So the other thing I wanted to mention real quick for our uh, time is this idea that they had of Athenian and exceptionalism. So this is something Praxithea quotes in this play, Euripides, about how Athens is an exceptional society. It's different than anybody else in the whole world. And the reason for that was because they felt like they came from the ground itself. They didn't come in from elsewhere. They were born there. Or they came from the ground. They came from that area itself. They didn't immigrate there from anywhere. That was their myth. And that reminded me, you know, as an American, had this idea of American exceptionalism. Except ours is the actual reverse, where we had this myth about how wonderful we are and how exceptional we are because we are a nation of immigrants where we all came from somewhere else. So I thought that was kind of cool uh, to think about. Um, then um, the other um, the other thing real quick before I, I, I completely run out of time, I think is just um, the, the notion of um, 
how I think, you know, I really took away this idea about how th people interpret history to, to benefit themselves or not to benefit themselves, but they, they interpret history in, in with their own biases and in the context in which they live. So she really spends a lot of time, this author spends a lot of time in the book exploring how the, the interpretation of the Parthenon has changed uh, throughout the centuries. Um, and um, I think it was just really interesting to see that evolve as well, how our idea of it as an ideal uh, has evolved over time. So with that, I will stop, and um, I will see you soon with the next video, soon to come. Thanks. Bye.